Many Russian researchers describe him as a simple-minded and ambitious person. As a political figure, he lacked influence in comparison to other Stalin's affiliates. And until the end, he was devoted to Stalin. Voroshilov was born on February 4, 1881, in the family of a retired soldier, a watchman on the railway. Klim's mother worked as a cook and laundress. The family lived in Lugansk province. This was a poor family where everyone was illiterate, including little Klim. He started working at the age of six and herded cows. At 11, he went to work in a mine as an auxiliary worker near Lugansk, one of the industrial centers of the Donetsk Basin. He was able to attend the elementary school only for two years. At the age of 15, Voroshilov began working at a metallurgical plant in the city of Alchevsk, first as a courier, then as an assistant driver at a water pumping station as a mechanic in an electrical workshop and as a crane operator in an iron foundry. Here, in Alchevsk, 17-year-old Klim joined a social democratic circle. He participated in the strike and was arrested, fired from his job, and then for three years wandered around the southern provinces of Russian Empire, doing odd jobs. In 1903, Voroshilov returned to Donbass and got a job in Lugansk at the Hartman locomotive plant. In Lugansk, in the same year, a city social democratic organization was created, which Voroshilov also joined. He joined the Bolshevik faction and soon became a member of its city committee. He led the demonstrations and strikes in Lugansk. In the summer of 1905, Voroshilov was arrested but he was released on bail. At the beginning of 1906, Voroshilov was elected from the Lugansk Social Democrats as a delegate to the Fourth Congress of the Russian Social Democrats. There he first met Lenin, and he also met and became friends with Stalin, who was known in the party circles under the name Koba. In 1907, Voroshilov met Ekaterina Davidovna Gorbman, who soon became his wife. They did not have their own children, but later they adopted three kids. The revolution of 1905-1907 ended in defeat for Bolsheviks. The Lugansk organization of the Bolsheviks was also destroyed. Voroshilov was arrested again and exiled to the Arhangelsk province. He escaped from exile to the south, to Baku, where in 1908 he worked with Stalin as a part of the Baku Bolsheviks Committee. That same year, he returned to St. Petersburg and was arrested again. Until 1912, Voroshilov went to many prisons and distant settlements of Arhangelsk. Having been freed, he returned to Donbass, where he resumed his activities among the workers. But he was captured again and sent into exile in Perm, from which he was released a year later under an amnesty on the occasion of the 300th anniversary of Romanov's royal house. The First World War began. Many Bolsheviks actually didn't run away from being drafted into the army. They went to the front to conduct Bolsheviks' agitation there and prepare the army to participate in the revolution. But Voroshilov decided to avoid mobilization. Therefore, he and his family settled in Petrograd, where he began working in a small factory and established contact with the illegal city committee of the Bolsheviks. However, he was called to Lugansk again. By the end of July, the Lugansk Bolshevik organization already included 2,500 people. And already in August, the Bolsheviks won the elections to the city Duma here, of which Voroshilov was elected chairman. Voroshilov was in charge of the Lugansk Bolsheviks military group. His group retreated from Lugansk and reached Tsaritsyn, where Stalin was posted in summer 1918. Voroshilov was given a command of the 10th Army. Stalin and Voroshilov led the Red Army's defense of Tsaritsyn. After the First World War, the civil war has started. 
In Ukraine, it was particularly fierce and complex, and Voroshilov took part in battles with detachments of the Ataman Grigoriev and Makhno. Then he defended Ekaterinoslav and commanded the internal Ukrainian front. He was criticized by Lenin for his lack of professionalism and high losses. But in 1919, Voroshilov became commander of the 14th Army. A month later, he surrendered Kharkov to Denikin, for which the Revolutionary Court recognized his knowledge of military affairs as minimal. It was impossible to trust him even with the command of a battalion. He was suspended. In April 1921, he was appointed as a commander of the North Caucasus Military District. In March 1924, he was promoted to the post of commander of the Moscow Military District. Voroshilov performed mainly representative functions and the functions of the political leader of the army, doing little about issues of military affairs and studying the problems of military strategy. Voroshilov never became a professional military and he lacked both general and special military education. When Stalin was able to remove Trotsky from command of the Red Army, Frunze was put in charge with his deputy Voroshilov. But in 1925, Frunze suddenly died and Voroshilov was appointed as People's Commissar for Military and Navy Affairs and Chairman of the Revolutionary Military Council of the USSR, a post he held until 1934. In 1926, Voroshilov was elected to the Politburo. He undoubtedly sided with Stalin during his power struggles. For example, in 1927, he addressed the July-August plenum of the Central Committee with his statement directed against Trotsky. In the end of the 20s, Voroshilov still retained the features of an independent personality. In 1928 and 29, when Stalin launched an offensive campaign against the peasantry, Voroshilov sometimes expressed doubts about such policy at the Politburo meetings. He feared that the discontent of the peasantry would affect the combat effectiveness of the Red Army, which was staffed mainly by peasant youth. But these were just concerns and he never directly opposed Stalin. In the 30s, he was a part of Stalin's closest circle and was considered as his intimate friend. They sat together on the presidiums of various meetings, stood side by side on the podium of the mausoleum, went hunting together, vacationed in the South, spent time at Stalin's dacha and in his apartment in the Kremlin. In the same period, the city of Lugansk was renamed to Voroshilograd. A large city in the North Caucasus, Stavropol, was renamed to Voroshilovsk. Factories, collective farms and mountain peaks named after Voroshilov appeared. The best shooters received the honorary title Voroshilov Shooter. In 1935, Voroshilov received the title Marshal during the first purchase in August 1936. Voroshilov was one of the Politburo members who signed the order for the defendants were to be executed without delay. Although he did not create the list of military officials for the persecution, but he signed the lists created by others. Voroshilov personally signed 185 documented execution lists, fourth among the Soviet leadership after Molotov, Stalin, and Kaganovich. The repressions caused terrible damage to the combat effectiveness of the Red Army, decreased its personnel, the consequences of which could already be seen in Soviet-Finnish War 1939-1940. The results of the Soviet-Finnish War or Winter War campaign were analyzed in April 1940 at an extended meeting of the main military council. At this meeting, it was talked about the mistakes of Voroshilov as the People's Commissar of Defense. Despite the victory, Voroshilov was removed from his post as a military commissar of defense. During the Second World War, he reassured the country with speeches that the Red Army supposedly had more powerful firepower than any other army, 
while the German army had an advantage in most type of weapons in reality. Voroshilov was assigned to Leningrad, but could not prevent the blockade and was recalled. He no longer led the army. Stalin spared Voroshilov. In September 1942, Voroshilov became commander-in-chief of the partisan movement. After the war, Voroshilov almost completely withdrew from military affairs. As a member of the Politburo and Bureau of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, he received a new assignment to head various cultural departments. This bureau was in charge of the activities of the country's theaters, the Committee for Cinematography and Book Publishing. During these years, Stalin did not take Voroshilov into account. He not only alienated Voroshilov, but repeatedly expressed political distrust to him in the presence of other members of the Central Committee, and Voroshilov was not invited to Politburo meetings. Nevertheless, he stayed at the Presidium of Central Committee. Until the end of Stalin's life, only two members of the top leadership of the party addressed him as a first-name basis. It was Molotov and Voroshilov. At the same time, Voroshilov often called Stalin Koba. Immediately after Stalin's death, Voroshilov took part in the meetings of senior officials at which the distribution of power was discussed. Soon after Generalissimo's death, the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR decided to declare a very broad amnesty, on the basis of which hundreds of thousands of convicts were released from prisons and camps. Since the decree of the Presidium was signed by Voroshilov, this amnesty was popularly called Voroshilov's. On March 15, 1953, Voroshilov was approved as a chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. He was a head of the state, with Nikita Khrushchev as a first secretary of the Communist Party and George Malenkov as a premier of the Soviet Union. Voroshilov supported Malenkov and Khrushchev in removing Beria. The beginning of the rehabilitation of enemies and especially the report of Khrushchev on February 25, 1956, on the cult of personality and its consequences, raised the question of the responsibility of those who, in addition to Stalin, were part of the power structure and were responsible for purges. Marshall admitted his responsibility in purges of the Red Army top military officials. But at the same time, he claimed that it was Stalin's mistake and he was just followed the great man judgment. Voroshilov did not have a friendly collaboration with Khrushchev. He supported Molotov, Malenkov and Kaganovich when they opposed Khrushchev in June 1957. Voroshilov, however, was not a very faithful ally of Molotov and Malenkov. He again sided with Khrushchev. Therefore, the name of Voroshilov was not mentioned in the decisions of the plenum of an anti-party group. Voroshilov himself, already in early July, speaking in Leningrad, once again condemned the vile attempt of Molotov, Malenkov and Kaganovich to oppose the Leninist leadership of the Communist Party Central Committee in the person of Comrade Khrushchev. As a result, Voroshilov retained his post as the head of the state for several years. The disloyalty of Voroshilov, shown in June 1957, was still not forgotten. The city of Lugansk, which was renamed Voroshilograd in 1935, became Lugansk again in 1958. In 1960, when Voroshilov was already 79 years old, he was relieved of his duties as chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. Voroshilov's departure from the post of head of state was marked by a word of the title of Hero of Socialist Labor. Fifty-year-old Leonid Brezhnev was elected as chairman of the Presidium. Voroshilov was not deprived of the privileges that he had enjoyed in the past. Therefore, he quietly lived his last years at a large Dutch estate in the Moscow region with his family. In the mid-60s, Voroshilov began working on his memoirs. In the winter of 1969, 
When the marshal was 88 years old, he felt unwell but forbade calling doctors. In the morning, he put on all his medals and went to the hospital. A few days later, he died. That was a story about a marshal who did not know military science, but managed Red Army most of his life. In my opinion, Voroshilov was a simple-minded person, and the lack of ambitious and desire for power let him ally with the stronger ones and survive all the purges. Thank you for watching my channel. Please subscribe to it, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!